We have quite a bit of research from the IAEA outlining the types of radiation embrittlement that happens in nuclear reactors, in the reactor buildings, in any of the 10,000 parts in those reactor buildings. Now they state right from the IAEA's own PDF on the subject, there are two types of embrittlement which do affect power water reactor vessel internal components. This is irradiation embrittlement, which may affect core region internals and thermal aging embrittlement, which may affect the cast stainless steel parts and parts manufactured from stainless steel. Fatigue, corrosion, and then we have also radiation induced creep, relaxation, and swelling. Neutron irradiation creates a large number of interstitials and vacancies that can annihilate on sinks such as dislocations, grain boundaries, surfaces, etc. by a diffusion controlled process. The kinetics of this annihilation are different for interstitials and vacancies and depend on stress, temperature, material microstructure, etc. If interstitials are eliminated rapidly, the excess vacancies coalesce into voids or bubbles inside of the metal, which lead to swelling of the structure. Now this is why they have to replace reactor shrouds every so often, because the steel becomes so brittle. Now we're used to different types of steel being used in infrastructure and aluminum and cadmium and nickel being used in airline skins. But these are all affected in similar ways. And Loren, you and I were talking just before we started taping tonight mm -hmm. about some re research that you came across from Oak Ridge Labs. Yes. Um, the way this discovery of the Wigner effect occurred, um, of course, I've been working with you on... Um, airplane um, emergency landings and problems with batteries and things like that. And um, I had no idea. I didn't know about the Wigner effect. I've never heard of it. But I began looking for um, information, and I came across a paper published in uh, about the 1970s by Oak Ridge National Lab. And it was a paper on uh, historic earlier events and departments and discoveries at Oak Ridge in the 1950s. And it was called Clinton Labs at that time, and it was managed uh, by Monsanto uh, for the, uh, the U.S. government. Now, Dr. Wigner was an immigrant from uh, Austria, I believe. I think he came from Vienna, but I think he was actually German. And he came over to the United States in, before uh, the U.S. even joined World War II. And he was immediately made a Manhattan Project scientist. So he was working on the creation of the nuclear bombs uh, during World War II and also on uh, depleted uranium was also proposed as a radioactive poison gas weapon uh, under the Manhattan Project. I don't know exactly what research he did, but when World War II was over and the Manhattan Project ended, some of those scientists became Jason scientists which are civilian scientists for the Pentagon, and um, they just rebranded the Manhattan Project scientists under a new contract, and they were called Jason Scientists. Now, when World War II was over, the U.S. government and probably international entities, I'm sure they were, wanted to develop nuclear power. And, of course, um, that was Eisenhower's program, uh, Atoms for Peace. Now, Dr. Wigner 
was sent to the Clinton Laboratory, which is now the Oak Ridge Laboratory, and he did extremely basic research. He was a mathematician, and all science starts with mathematics. Uh, it ends up in on the desk of engineers because they make it work. Uh, they produce the, um, the final package. And Dr. Vigner was uh, doing research on the effect of radioactive uh, bombardment of metals in doing basic research to produce uh, metals and understand what the effects of radiation would be on metals used in nuclear reactors. So he was doing that early research on the effect of alpha particles, beta particles, gamma rays, and x-rays that are all ejected from the nucleus of radioactive materials, and they bombard anything that is around them. Now, um, there are almost 2,000 radionuclides that are produced in a fission process, such as Fukushima. So when, uh, when uh, the media or sort of lay people, um, whatever uh, governments that are trying to deceive people, they will talk about basically cesium, strontium-90, uh, radioactive iodine, and uh, they forget to tell people that there are almost 2,000 radionuclides that are being bombarded by. And uh, radiation has a cumulative effect. So when these energy rays and particles are bombarding metal, they, they create a flow of electrons on the surface of the metal. In, in ancient times, uh, the Japanese and also the steel makers in Damascus, the sword makers in Damascus, um, knew that if they heated steel and they pounded it, and they heated it and pounded it, and they heated it and pounded it, um, it made it stronger and stronger and stronger and more flexible each time. So uh, the Japanese samurai sword makers and the Damascus sword makers in um, the Middle East were uh, the centers of the discovery of annealing metals. And so what that heating and pounding does is it drives all of the defects um, in the in the steel, out of the steel, and makes it stronger and more flexible. It aligns the crystals and it adds the carbon, which in mm -hmm. addition to tempering, brings you your hardness. Yes. So um, Dr. Vigner uh, reported that, and he also reported that um, bombardment by nuclear um, energy would uh, release, it would, it would create hydrogen, uh, which builds up, and that's exactly what happened, and it's released by the surface of the metal, and that's exactly what happened uh, that caused the, uh, the first explosions at Fukushima. The fissioning started, it uh, ran away because the cooling systems were shut down by the earthquake and 15 minutes after the earthquake those reactors were already in meltdown and by 7 p.m. that night on March the 11th by 7 p.m. all the reactors had completely melted down and also melted through the wall of the reactor outer shell making what are known as yes. elephant feet no. on their way down to the earth right right through the cement and making it they, right there yes. that's where it starts it dripped it burned right through the floor of the um the uh floor that the reactor was sitting on and it dripped down into the basement and then it it burned right through the floorboard of the reactor building into the ground and as it drips, it accumulates, and it becomes a bigger and bigger, bigger collection of the radioactive fuel, um, these 
the fuel pellets in the reactor actually melt. And um, as time goes on, it is burning down deeper and deeper into the ground. And three years later, that reactor material is at least 80 feet down on the ground and it's flowing into the ocean. It's contaminating the water table. It is contaminating the Fukushima Bay. It is creating brim sprawling in the steam. It is making over the Fukushima Bay. That's right. This is a real mess. And getting back to entropy for a second, when you're in the presence of that concentration of radionuclides, the rate of acceleration on entropy becomes staggering. In point of fact, putting a nuclear reaction of any variety inside of a container and pretending that you're holding it, it's not a truth. What it is, is you have a measured piece of fuse. And the question becomes, how long did you measure your fuse? And so what we're talking about today is the amount of radiation that's been released into the atmosphere, into the ground, into the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, has now circulated and mixed in the environment, in the biosphere, uh, the atmosphere, for three years. And what we're seeing is an acceleration and an increase almost exponential of uh, the Wigner effects on airlines and airplanes, the crews, the passengers, and the entire air column from the ground up to space is all contaminated with uh, the Fukushima radiation. And that's what we're covering today. What is happening to the airplanes? Well, just as far as, as number one goes, the indicators that we have from just basic knowledge about metallurgy, as outlined by Dr. Wigner, we have um, the environmental science, science and technology reports, reports from the IAEA about metal degradation as outlined in the heavy component replacement in nuclear power plants, which was published most recently in 2008. We know that rat exposure will cause this embrittlement and create hydrogen in the metal matrix. And then we observe some of this happening over the, the course of the Fukushima accident too, and, and many researchers have voiced their concern about the fuel pools, about the integrity of everything at the site because of this constant bombardment. So it's something with, with time will get worse, much like all the other things that we've talked about in the last three and a half years. You know, the mutations, sickness, accumulation in, in different organisms, and the effects of that, this is all happening very fast. Yes, Christina, it is. it actually has escalated to the next level. And we have to bring it back around to entropy one more time to explain this one. Because now what we have is a compromised reactor vessel. The fuse on Fukushima ran out, and they lit it off because they had themselves an earthquake. That earthquake was engineered, so this fuse was actually accelerated by the Navy. Now, what you have is this accelerated fuse has compromised your containment vessels, and your containment vessels have leaked. That leak is out, that leak is down into the groundwater. Now, what is occurring here is that you've got this in a water base, and you've got yourself a large brim strawling, and you have got yourself a pile that is inclusive of two different, un very unstable, basic radionuclides. These are your uraniums and your plutoniums. And the differentiation in the temperatures and things between those creates neutron pulse, which is the up of the ante on this particular problem. 